that's that's the story really of my most dramatic call and of how opposition happens whenever God wants to work through us. Again, that was a very spiritualized opposition. Sometimes it's very practical. Very often, it's both. Let's look at Nehemiah's opposition. Opposition really comes from three places. It comes from ourselves, confusion, discouragement, second guessing, fear. It comes from other people, people that either on purpose or simply blindly are, are blocking what God is doing. And it comes from the devil who can work in any of those ways and more through direct temptation, through intimidation, through setting up obstacles, through inciting us to confusion, all kinds of things. And when that happens, I mean, that's really an invitation for us to stick close to God. Pull out the Psalms and smack talk the devil. It works. It may feel a little silly and old fashioned, but hey, if it worked for St. Anthony, it can work for us. All right. God calls Nehemiah to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. But as we know, any worthy mission for God is going to face opposition. The leaders of Judah's neighbors are angry that the king has, spent a spe has sent a special envoy to Jerusalem, especially Sanballat and Tobiah. Sanballat, the leader of the Samaritans, Tobiah, the leader of the Ammonites. Think Ammon, Jordan. That's, uh, that's the spot. The Judah's neighbors just to the east. The Samaritans are the neighbors just to the north. They want Jerusalem to stay weak and unpopulated. That's not all. There's also opposition from inside. We find out later in the book that the high priest, Eliashib, has married his grandson off to Sanballat the Samaritan's daughter. Tobiah, the Ammonite, his son like Lawise, is married into a Jewish noble family. They're all interrelated at this point. And these nobles, Nehemiah realizes they might not be thrilled that the king has sent him to rebuild Jerusalem. They're already struggling to eke out a living in this new land. They don't want to do anything bold that would antagonize their neighbors. Nehemiah wisely begins by playing it low key. For the first few days, he doesn't tell anyone that God and the king have commissioned him to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. He takes in the local politics, sees what's happening, but then he gets up in the middle of the night and he takes a walk around the walls of the city. He inspects the walls, surveys the damage, get an idea of what needs to be done. Only then does he call the people together and announce the grand plan. You see the trouble we are in, how Jerusalem lies in ruins with its gates burned. Come, let us build the walls of Jerusalem that we may no longer suffer disgrace. He tells them his personal story, how the hand of the Lord was upon him, how God had changed the king's heart, how the king had spoken. And the people are moved. They reply, let us rise up and build. God is with us. Sanballat and Tobiah and Geshem the Arab harass them. What are you doing? Are you rebelling against the king? But the people are inspired. They start to rebuild anyway. Nehemiah knew he would face opposition. He moved forward anyway. How often are we afraid to step up and do what's right? because we're afraid of what the people around us might think. We get to remember, like Nehemiah did, that the hand of the Lord is with us. Also, Nehemiah shared his personal story. He said, this is what God has been doing in my life. And the people wanted to be part of that. They said, let's share in God's work so that others can see the good works that we're doing and glorify God. So now the opposition intensifies. Sanballat and Tobiah are enraged. They begin to mock the people's work and the hearing of everyone around. <clears throat> the, the, the mocking, I think, must lose something in translation. It's a little stilted. What do these feeble Jews think they are doing? Do they think they can finish this work in a day? Do they think they can revive the burned stones of Jerusalem out of this heap of rubble? And Tobiah chimes in, a fox could jump on that wall and break it down. Their smack talk has no effect. So, they start talking with the other neighbors, the Arabs, the Ashdodites. Ashdod, I remember, was a Philistine city back in the time of David. They start planning a sneak attack on Jerusalem. Hit them hard before they can finish the wall. That's the plan. Nehemiah stays strong. 
He leads the people in prayer and sets up a guard over Jerusalem. But the people are still rattled. There's the opposition coming from within. The people say, our strength is failing and there's so much rubble, we can't keep working on the wall. And the Jews who lived near Sanballat and Tobiah warned Nehemiah over and over again, we hear them talking. They're going to attack us on every side all together. We're all going to die. So Nehemiah stepped it up. He prepared for battle. He armed all the builders with swords, spears, and bows and stationed them wherever the walls were still low. And he gave them a rallying speech. Do not be afraid. Remember the Lord. Fight for your families. And what happened next? Nothing. I think of all that, that spiritual warfare I just told about in the, the story of St. Anthony, where it was one attack after the next, and I was told we're going to attack with greater force, and then nothing. Sometimes the devil will psych us out. Israel's enemies were deflated that their sneak attack was no longer secret. They called off the attack, and the builders put down their weapons and got back to work. Uh, but from that point on, half of the builders stood guard in full armor, while the other half piled up stones, and every builder had a sword strapped to his side at all times. At night, they all slept at the building site and took turns keeping watch. Sanballat and Tobiah weren't through yet. By this time, there's no gaps left in the wall, but the gates were not yet built. Sanballat and Tobiah send for Nehemiah and say, come, let us meet together and talk. They planned to ambush him. Nehemiah kept making excuses. I'm really busy with this wall project, could it wait? Finally, Sanballat wrote, we all know how you Jews are planning to rebel against Persia. That's why you're building the wall, we know it. You plan to set up prophets to declare you king. We're gonna tell our Artaxerxes, we're gonna report this. Let's meet together. Nehemiah still refused to waver. He sent back the reply, you are inventing all of this out of your own mind. He knew they just wanted to frighten and intimidate him. He also knew they could make a false report to Artaxerxes and do him and all of Judah real harm, but he just had to trust God and keep moving forward. He prayed, oh God, strengthen my hands. All right, more opposition. This time, they get tricky. A Jew named Shemaiah warned Nehemiah, let us go to the temple, take refuge there and shut the doors for they are coming to kill you tonight. Nehemiah is a layman. Only priests are allowed in the temple. He perceived that Shemaiah was bribed by Sanballat and Tobiah to make him do something that would discredit him in the eyes of his own people. Nehemiah wrote that there were other self-proclaimed prophets that tried to confuse him and make him afraid. But every time he refused to listen, what kind of discernment and determination is that when all the people around you, people that you think are your friends are telling you, stop, you're wrong, stop, you need to talk to Sanballat and Tobiah, you know, stop, they're going to attack. What kind of discernment does it take to go, no, moving forward, no, moving forward, over and over again, to keep that kind of focus? Wow. There's actually a line in Nehemiah where he says, I consulted my own heart and then acted. He's an incredibly independent person. He consults his own heart. He consults his conscience and the Holy Spirit, and he just keeps going. Wow. The wall was completed in 52 days, despite all the threats, the distractions, the armed guard. This was so obviously miraculous that all the nations around were afraid because they saw that the work had been accomplished with the help of God. The priests dedicated the wall and blessed it, and everyone sang psalms of praise to God. A lottery was set up, and one in 10 families was chosen to move to Jerusalem so the city could be repopulated. Jerusalem now is back on the map. God kept his promises and did what he said he would do.